I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Thomas O'Neill White. I'm Angelie Preston. We need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is What's Next. A dedicated hour to have important conversations about the issues facing the marginalized and underrepresented communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. What's Next continues our mission to discuss race, equity, and the common concerns of Buffalo's East Side and beyond. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. I'm host Thomas O'Neill White, and I'd like to welcome back author, poet, storyteller, martial arts expert, activist, and advocate, Dorian Withrow Jr. Dorian, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I just ran down a list of titles for you, um, but how how would you best describe yourself? Well, I wouldn't say a martial art expert, but... Um, <laughs> I'm a I'm a baby in the field of you know my martial arts taekwondo. Uh huh. But I, how would I describe myself? I would say, I'd say a genuine person, uh, a person that means well and wants to help others, um, a person that has his flaws but constantly working to improve and things like that. You know. Last time you were with us, um, almost a year to the day, um, November first, twenty twenty two. It is now it is now Halloween, twenty twenty three. Um, you've had one book published, and you are working on another one. Um, let's talk about this. This in the last year, you've published uh, conversations you need. This is your fourth published book, um, a novel. What topics are you exploring in this book? Oh, it's a it's a self help book, right? It's a book based on like dialogue. Right. So there are these conversations we have day to day with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so what I did, it was I recalled stories. I recalled conversations from people. And what I did was I tried to make them in a way that will teach somebody some kind of lesson within the book. What what type of lessons are we talking about? Oh, um, so if I were to give one conversation, she doesn't know this, but it's one of the master's instructors I, I work with. Um, she helped me a lot. So one of the conversations we had, it was during our private lesson and I wasn't putting enough power into my technique. I was trying to make sure the pattern we do was good. Mm -hmm. And, and this I is, this is through your martial arts. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And I was trying to avoid making mistakes, but she had taught me to let that go, put your all into it. You're going to fall, you're going to stumble, but you're going to improve. And she taught me there that, you know, mistakes are good. And we constantly learn that, like, mistakes are okay. But, um, like, then and there, I kind of just, you know, don't strive for perfection. Put your all into it. You're going to fall down. But through these stumbles, I eventually will meet the goal of having a better pattern, more power to it, things like that. Do you consider yourself a perfectionist? Um, I mean, I think... For me personally, yes, and having those stumbles is like a huge, like block to me that I can't overcome. Like that, that sense of failure is is a lot. Do you do you feel the same way? Yeah, I, I um, I try to be the best that I can be in whatever I'm doing. Yeah, I'm always trying to improve, but I also realize that I'm a human being. You know, there's there's gonna be faults that we all have, mm -hmm. and you know, eventually we got to realize that, you know, we're not going to have it all down all the time. And, you know, it's essential that we remember that we're in a continuous process of growth. And the more mistakes that we make, we're better off avoiding those later on, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you you uh, you're a philosophy guy. You are in this in this book. You incorporate philosophical lessons for personal growth. Um, you said you you knew nothing about philosophy until you reached college. Um, what was it that made you embrace philosophy? Uh, for one, I think it was the, for me, it's the class structure. 
I liked that I could have dialogue with other students within my class to talk about um, a variety of things to come to a kind of solution or maybe some answer that, you know, or maybe no answer. Maybe no answer you know, at all. Right. But it's working through things and um, kind of disputing a bit and coming up with some new perspectives and outlooks. That's one aspect I like of it. The other aspect is the readings and um, just the essential information I came across, I felt had helped me and it resonated with me because it um it tackled some of the challenges we would face in life generally. That's the way I kind of see why I gravitated towards that. And you picked this up in college? Yeah. Who is one of your favorite philosophers? I would say uh, Confucius. Confucius? Um, but I have a few. I I would say he's like top tier, but for me, um, I would say his outlook on the importance of family, um, some other general ideas, actions meeting words, and how often we have trouble with that, right? We could always be better in that department. Um, putting good people around people that aren't struggling morally in life or um, in any other aspect, how can we improve people? And I think philosophy has some of those answers that we haven't necessarily we overlook sometimes and we don't necessarily in, like implement yeah speaking of implementation is there anything from confucius that you've learned that you have been able to input into your life or help others i think a good one i'd like to uh kind of put out there and uh, especially nowadays i think is a uh, one of aristotle's ideas about um, relationships mm -hmm. so we have relationships for use like using others to get what we want to advance and whatnot right um we'd have relationships for other means but i think one of the important parts that he touches upon is um loving someone or liking someone for the sake of themselves like um genuinely engaging the person because of who they are and not what they have or what they can do for you is um it's something I like to press upon. And I, I put that in um one of my other books, like Wisdom 45 Advice, when I talked about friendships, what kind of friendships are meaningful and what, what kind of friendships do you want? Like, and why do mm -hmm. you want it? Well, what, what type of friendships are meaningful to you? Oh, the ones that I can, I, you know, it's the people that I can go to for advice, the people that, you know, are the ones that I can be genuine around, authentic. When I'm around, is there some kind of, conversation about growth in some way financially or um work wise or business wise or just something that I can improve upon. I mean even you, you know, you you know you help me with these interviews. So yeah, I, I <laughs> those are the to types facilitate, of, brother. Yeah, the types of friends I want around and those people that are genuine. They like you for who you are and not what they can do for you or what their use value is. Right, right. I appreciate that, Dorian. Um so getting to your your book you could you called it wisdom 45 advice there's really no working title as yet and you're you're finishing up on it um but this this book is is about comparing animal thought processes with human relationships do i have that right oh i'll say so wisdom 45 advice it's a book already out okay and um i'm working on this next one it's uh so i learned abec in college animal behavior ecology and conservation yes and uh, what I what I'm doing is I'm using the concepts I've learned from animal behavior primarily, and a little bit of biology, to relate it for human relationships, and like um, using those concepts and taking from those, and applying it to ways we can improve human relationships, like evolution, for example, um, descent with modification, but how can we relate it to people? As time goes on, I think at a certain type of evolution, that's not biology, but as time goes on, we want to improve ourselves for our partners, improve the way we see things, um, constantly learning and evolving so that we can, you know, make adjustments and change what might be, you know, wrong with us or what we others perceive wrong and, um, you know, constantly, you know, just essentially seek a way to be better with having a connection with somebody else. Did you have this idea about ABEC when you were younger? 
I mean, when did it, when did you get drawn into this realm of study? Um, so I, I was interested in when I was a teenager, right? So I was interested in uh, veterinary science. I went to animal science at BOCES. It was a program, like, so it was a two-year program in high school. I learned about um, the medical side of dealing with animals. I was coming up to time for putting in college applications. My teacher at the time, she had addressed to me that this program is at Kanisha's. You're interested in behavior. I think you should try and apply. I did. She was one of my references. I got in, um, had the best package. So I was like, you know, why not? <laughs> you know, so I I went with it from there. And um, that's where I kind of got engaged with ABEC. I wouldn't have known about it if it wasn't for her to put it in my ear to go with it. So, and I'm grateful I did. Do you have a, do you have a spirit animal? I think I did like something a while ago, like I think a condor. Oh yeah? yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure what that means. Or, <laughs> I'm not even sure if that's correct, but I don't, you know, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have a spirit animal. Um, talk to me about your growth as a writer and then um, a little bit about understanding the business of authorship. Yeah, um, I would say as a writer, I had to, well, I'll tell you the good aspects first. So I think my diversity in like writing styles in the books is something unique for me. I I, I did poetry, like short stories, mm-hmm. different types of poetry, like free verse, spoken word, and haiku. Um, right, that's something we touched on in our, yeah. in our first interview. Yeah. I did uh, essay based, and in the most recent book, Conversations You Need, I had dialogue based books. So dialogue based book, I had uh, quotes intertwined between like the each conversation, and to give people a different feel for reading. I made it for people that may not necessarily read a lot. The people that need this kind of um, self growth and self help advice. And I gave different ways to digest that self-help and self-growth through these three books. Um, I hope people that I've received some feedback, people like it. And I want to make sure that I'm giving people what they need out of these things in an adjustable way. And then the, uh, understanding the business of authorship. You were, We were talking a little bit about that earlier. Yeah. Just n- navigating the business world. Yeah, it's um, it's a very big learning curve. I I didn't know what I was doing, kind of starting off. It was kind of just the book, but I'm working on um marketing more, um things like building an emailing list and, uh you know, kind of engaging the audience in a very different way. A little bit of self disclosure. I'm, I I can be shy on like social media. I suppose like I, I'm not right. very, not too much of myself. Mm-hmm in the you know online presence but more of like you know behind this wall of like uh, promotion and you know videos to uh drag people in and things like that so i want to work on you know being more present i'd say and what's what was um the advice you got from your mother oh essentially that like yeah you know kind of letting myself putting myself more more myself into the media space as opposed to keeping it like a too professional. Right. I think letting, letting it more of me there as opposed to this, uh, shiny outside, you know what I mean? Yeah. But that comes with a certain amount of comfort. You have to reach a certain yeah. level to, to do that. Yeah. How do you work through that? Um, I would say just kind of go for it. And vulnerability is something that you constantly have to work at it's not easy right but it's simple because it's just doing it right Mm -hmm. um being plain with your speech being frank and also being considerate of yourself but yet like just exposing and being okay with it being okay with what might come back and being okay with knowing that that's out there for people to see do you ever get writer's block and and if so how do you work through that uh, I do. Um, but when you, you're constantly thinking all the time, it's 
it's it's a to get out of writer's block i would say is you know seek inspiration but also have the mind to pick up things that others wouldn't as you're moving through your day um how can for me my lane is self-help and personal growth can i look at something and make that into a lesson a story something like that and and once again uh, give me the titles of of the books you've published Please give give them all to me, please. Thoughts of Creativity King, 114 Realities, Wisdom 45 Advice, Conversations You Need. And I had a co-author of my very first book, which was um, Speak Young, Brown People Speak, We Are Listening. And uh, money bought from that book goes to a proceed in um, a youth program. And um, yeah, you should check those out. Is, is Wisdom 45 Advice, is that 45... Is, okay. What's what's the number? So, it, oh, it's simple. It's just uh, forty five different topics, with my thoughts, life lessons, and philosophy placed into it to help people. For example, vulnerability. It talks about friendship, um, becoming a good man, what that entails, what goes into that. Um, I also talk about the power of a fr- l- <laughs> reflection. Uh huh. Um, so there's these different topics that I see fit or important to have for people to have so that they can meet their goals, overcome their troubles. These are things that I found have worked for me and I want to provide that for others. What do you think uh, goes into being a man? I know that's changed over history and sometimes I guess these days there are you know, there's the new man and then there's the old way of thinking of how men should be. But I guess it it comes and goes with who you talk to. What's, what's your what's your idea? I don't really want the, like a definition, but what's yeah. your idea of a man? Um, how about I address some things from the book? And yeah, absolutely. Or, or, or Please do. Is. I think um, so having a role model, someone that does what they say they'll do. They're in a good standing in life. They're morally, ethically accountable. Um, This person looks out. They're very good to you. And other aspects, exploring yourself, um, constantly learning, and, you know, they're having that self-development. In a nutshell, that's kind of what I can put out without going too far into that. But You're listening to What's Next? Thomas O'Neill White welcoming back author Dorian Withrow Jr. We'll be back after these messages. Watch great videos produced by your public media stations online. Find Buffalo Toronto Public Media on YouTube and check out interviews by our WNED classical hosts, original productions from WNED PBS, and so much more. Do you hear that? That's the lullaby of Broadway. Join me, Anthony Chase, on a memorable trip to New York City, January 22nd through the 26th. We'll see five hit Broadway shows, Kimberly Akimbo and Juliet, Back to the Future, A Beautiful Noise, and Shocked. And we'll eat at Sardi's. Transportation, hotel, and select meals are also included. Space is limited, so don't delay. Call 716-630-3731 or visit wned.org slash travel. Hey, is this thing on? Test, test, one, two. Sounds great. Let's go. The podcast world is overflowing with more than 750,000 podcasts to choose from. But for great local podcasts, you can now go to one place, the new Amplify BTPM Pods app. Here you can discover content produced in Western New York and Southern Ontario, our own backyard. With a wide variety of genres to choose from, there is something for everyone. Listen to the best independently produced podcast in the region anywhere, anytime. Download the free Amplify BTPM Pods app wherever you get your apps and begin exploring your local podcast community now. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? 
email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And this is What's Next, Thomas O'Neill White, and I am joined by a returning guest, author Dorian Withrow Jr. We're talking books, we're talking philosophy, we're talking mental health, and right now we're going to talk about martial arts. Uh, Dorian, you're 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 a pretty accomplished martial artist, although you're being pretty humble about it right now. Um, you are a first degree black belt. Do I have that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, when did you discover martial arts, and and in what discipline are you in? Oh, uh, for me, I discovered it. Uh, I, I don't need to say discovered. I would say like, you know, through movies and TV. Um, it started with my grandfather, so he was the one to teach me uh, Ishanru karate, and we he take us to the waterfront and we practice. Me and my brother, we learned the basics. Um, he wasn't always readily available over mm-hmm. time. It's granted, but I eventually went on my own to seek out a place. I found ITF Taekwondo and kind of stuck with it ever since. What has martial arts taught you? Oh, a lot of things. Uh, we talked about mistakes earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a communication aspect, too, like not being so critical ourselves i think we can fall into that sometimes when we're trying to perform and be perfectionists like we were talking about earlier um but i think what it taught me essentially with communication in regards to helping somebody else give positive and negative but give twice as much positive so that people understand that they have made mistakes but they're also doing good and it'll help them build the confidence and self-esteem to you know continue performing and striving to do better what type of well what martial arts movies um are your favorites to watch and is there a, a certain martial artist that you're like anytime you see them on tv it's like oh, i gotta watch this i don't have a particular martial artist i've, I've watched uh i wouldn't say they're been very popular but raid and raid 2 they're very violent and gory movies but <laughs> they um I'd, I'd say i like them because they show a lot of the cool flashy stuff that we see Mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily what um self-defense is in the martial art aspect but i I couldn't say there's like a particular martial artist it was more of like i just saw this awesome stuff as a kid and it kind of drew me in and as i got older so i think that also speaks to exposure when we talk about kids um yeah to expose them to is very important for what will kind of guide their decisions or thought process later in life do you do you find yourself mixing philosophy with your martial arts? Oh yeah. So um don't want to keep, you know, booking it up, but you know, I also talk about Please do. the uh <laughs> core principles or um actually this upcoming book, I'm I'm kind of working on that part. Like what are these we have five tenets of Taekwondo, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self control, and indomitable spirit indomitable spirit. Um, how can we incorporate those things into our life, act them out every day through our interactions and things like that. So in that way, we have philosophy within art to also manage us and become good people of with good conduct while we're in society. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, essentially that's how philosophy mixes in with martial arts for me. And you And you said you are a teacher uh you teach martial arts um what what would be something you would tell someone who was thinking about um jumping in the game starting starting up in the martial arts realm Uh, just sort of like vulnerability it's simple just do it um it's not necessarily easy in the beginning you're gonna have your i mean you're gonna fall you're gonna stumble a bit you're going to be trying some new things you think you might not be able to do. And I think one of the other um, very important aspects of martial arts is that like you're, you're going to see yourself doing things that you didn't think you could do. I don't right? like, um, not that I would do this for self-defense, but we would talk about uh jump spinning, back kicks, hook kicks. 
I didn't know if I'd be able to do that. I see it in the movies, but I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> right. I have been, like, I'm proficient in it, I would say. Like, I'm very good at it. Uh-huh. So it's also exploring yourself and knowing what you're capable of and seeing what you're able to do. Um, if you're young, why you're able to do it. If you're older, may not be able to do it, but you're able to do some other things that um, martial arts would accommodate for and help you, you know, along your own journey of like, losing weight, um, having that space to focus and get rid of the world around you and then um you know things like that what's your routine before you practice how do you get how do you get in the in the mind frame to do that oh um most days it's not like a routine i'd say it's more of a I kind of go there practice like before i do anything i'd like to stretch i think that's mm-hmm. important can't forget stretching I actually had a pulled my hamstring for the first time ever before Oof. my black belt test. Oh, and that, that was not fun. But yeah, stretching is important. Drink lots of water. Take care of your body. Um, you know, warm up before you do something crazy. Don't just jump into it if you're a little younger. It's good to build that habit before you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, you get a little stiff and <laughs> all that. But um, yeah. So so it's not like a routine for you. It's just like this is my lifestyle now yeah i would say I, I try best to manage it along with other things so um i mean i practice as much as i'd like but i think um, i'm doing pretty good and yeah you are a big advocate for mental health uh, especially for children suicide and self-harm continue to be a growing public health concern in new york state um, you've got some ideas on preventative measures. Yeah, I think um, I want to put this out there for the schools. Yeah, please. Uh, generally, especially for the kids, adolescents, and teens, high school, middle school, and elementary. Place mental health counselors within the classroom. Um, what I mean by that is having them teach. I think there should be a curriculum surrounded around, you know, Developing coping mechanisms, um, having therapeutic sessions within the classrooms, um, learning healthy distractions, learning a variety of things that these kids need because they come from troubled environments, troubled mm-hmm. homes, um, abuse. I don't know what words I'm not allowed to say and what I am allowed to say, but uh, I'll say physical interactions, unfavorable ones. Uh huh. Right. Um, so I think that it'll improve their academic performance. School is sometimes the one place that they need to escape the outside troubles. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. how how do you advocate for that? Are you working with local organizations? No, I think this is my um, first, first strike for that. Right. I'm just, I I had this idea. I wanted to put it out there. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe if somebody would like to get in contact, I'd be open to discussing that more. And also, um, discussing this with mental health organizations, connecting with schools. My thing is I want this to be a continuous every year process for students to go through. Cause I think it's important to have it in their everyday life as opposed to having somebody just come in for a talk and that's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's good. Yeah. But I oh, think yeah, it's yeah. something that, you know, students should. It shouldn't be a one off thing yeah. like yeah. once a year. A mental health professional comes in yeah. and gives a speech to the class. Do you feel like it, it? I mean, it's it's mental health, so it's it's a health concern. Mm. I mean, could you could could schools just tie it with like gym class or something like that? I would like to isolate it. I think they yeah. can tie it to like gym class. Um, I want it to be a separate subject. I want it to be something that's not necessarily a lecture based thing, but I want to have these students build up coping mechanisms that maybe someone might like to write. They could do that. Or somebody might like to knit. Somebody might like to do origami or whatever their thing is practiced in class, done continuously, but also learn different things, learn what healthy relationships are like, learn how to deal with stress when it comes, um, testing anxiety, and their troubles at home, awfully ignored, um, not discussed much, but parents need to be awfully considerate 
like letting children be children. We talked about that at the fatherhood conference. Mm-hmm. Oh and, yeah, we'll get we'll we'll get yeah. into that too. Yeah, but um, you know, parents taking the steps also to help these children be their best selves, explore themselves, and also not always able, but produce an environment conducive to them being happy and making mm-hmm. progress in the ways that they need to and helping them, you know, just be themselves, but also, you know, yeah, that, that's what I got for that. Do, do you see, or how does, how do you see social media playing a role with youth and their mental health? Um, there's studies and it's, it's a mixed bag out there. So, you know, it's leading to more depression and stress and, uh, you know, contributing to suicide. Um, but it's also a tool for learning, um, becoming your better self, seeing good examples of people doing what they need to be doing in the community. Um, they have access to information that, you know, a lot of people don't, um, Mm -hmm. who don't use social media or don't have the technology. I think it's about what we teach our kids to engage in and learning that we set our own algorithm in a sense that we tailor our viewing time likes and shares and things like that you got to be conscious of how we or what we favor to view how do you navigate social media and your mental health oh yeah the two two together Mm. um i would like you're you're young you're a young guy i I, we had to talk about this in one of my mental health classes it was a foundation of mental health counseling and um like doom scrolling just scrolling endlessly <laughs> yes. to like watch things that's uh, more of a defense and avoidive mechanism than it is huh. a helping therapeutic process it's something that takes you away but kind of as a way to avoid the problem as opposed to maybe dealing with it or um it's it's not a coping mechanism right, right. so if yeah. like if i have an issue with something or someone my my avoidance would be to just like be on my phone or be on social yeah, media just, just sh- 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 scroll 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 yeah. that's interesting mm-hmm. um so how 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 do you 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 said you're not on social media that much but you kind of have to be with with the role yeah. that you're in oh yeah i like to i was it. I do like to watch funny videos. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like the informative stuff. Um, I've been trying to get better at, well, I was just talking about algorithms, um, trying to get better at not viewing the negative stuff. Yeah. Um, it's I don't hard. Really, it's I don't really hard. comment. I don't really like yeah. but, but it's And hard then, to like, sharing it. it mm-hmm. Right. Don't boost it's, that right. thing up for others, but don't boost it for yourself by partaking in it, following it friending it and engaging it i've i've unfriended a lot of people on social media just because of stuff that they shared not because of them as a person yeah but because of the stuff that they put out and i have to view because i'm looking through and it's just in my face Mm -hmm. and it's hard to ignore because it's your phone you know what i mean right right and you also do some work with the fatherhood initiative um through buffalo uh, prenatal perinatal network um, we've had Antoine Johnson on before shout out to Antoine mm-hmm. um, can you talk about the work you do with that organization um, so what I do is uh, well not really uh, work with them but I take I do engage in a lot of their services or offerings so they have a fatherhood class mm-hmm. I took and I learned a lot about um, myself I'm in a room with a bunch of older men who are fathers or one was a, on his way to be a father, and they have experience. They talk about their own trials and tribulations. They also discuss like ways to become a better father with communication or discipline, um, masculinity within the home, things like that. So for me, it was um I don't have a child of my own, but it's learning these things before I engage and become a father, mm-hmm. and um having a support system around to help me when that time comes and have this knowledge when the time comes to deal with, you know, 
all those uh, challenges that will come. And you said you wanted to be a father. Fatherhood is important to you? Yeah, father is important to me. I think um, family is important to me generally, but fatherhood is something that um, sits close to me because I, I do want to build a better rapport with my father. And um, I could probably touch on mental health counseling a bit. Like I, I did, a, I'm taking a mental health counseling sessions now. And for me, it was, I got into it because I saw that some of the things in my youth that I either saw or experienced when I was younger kind of didn't necessarily play out, but it's the responses to um, what I would have in my romantic, romantic relationships. Mm-hmm. Like I, I saw that some of my responses to things were like unfavorable. Like uh, one of my things is isolation and avoidance. It's not good for communication. It's not good for correct building a bond when challenges come. Mm-hmm. Um, so things like that, I wanted to tackle in therapy. So that's why I got a therapy. And I hope this is a call to people that have trouble with their own fathers as well. Um, I think me and my father are building a better bond than we used to have. Um, you saw him at the book signing. Yep, I saw him at the and, book signing. Um, I, I want to take steps. I'm working at you know building a better relationship with my father, and I hope this um, this message gets to other people and helps them kind of you know start their own process of rebonding, rebuilding. Do you worry about raising a child in this? socioeconomic climate this political climate this this social media age is there some is there some worry there for you i've had that question from a lot of people ironically like you're really not the first one to ask that my response is there has always been troubles in the world i'm not running from animals right at one point, that was a thing. Right. I am not trying to dodge the bubonic plague, although we had COVID. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, and you, you know, never know what's on or around the corner. I, th- I think that through our time, there, there's always been something to watch out for, many things to watch out for. But, um, with parenting, I think it's also key to remember that we're not trying to shield our children from the world, but to I think it's ideal to teach them, give them these moral lessons, these ethical lessons, so that when they come up to these challenges or run into these walls, they have they are equipped mentally to deal with a lot of these things that we're afraid of them engaging in. So that's why we, I do advocate putting children through martial arts and learning. I do advocate children learning philosophy and engaging in mental health. Equip them so that they're able to deal with, they have the tools to deal with troubles and they're able to build this fortress of solitude in their mind to, um, you know, combat a lot of these things that will invade and do harm. And how happy were you to have, to have your dad with you at that book signing at Barnes and Noble? Yeah, I, um, it was different. I, uh, I would say part of me was happy. I was, I'm glad to have somebody around to support. And I think that's very key. And we, um, we lose sight of that sometimes. It, and I think that we should embrace the people that we do have around for the good that they want to do and connect, you know. But um, that's my thoughts on that. What What's the biggest lesson you've learned from therapy for you? Uh, um, I think for me it was having this transformation like this – it was getting a lot of stuff off that I needed to. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, I, I cried all day. All day. And that's good, um, right? Is, yeah, yeah. You, feel, you find crying but, to be therapeutic? Yeah, I mean, we, we need to cry. I, I cried. Yeah. But, you know, it's just like um, you got to get this stuff off. And through that process of reflecting and looking at, uh, you know, reflecting on my family, um, things like that. I kind of came to this conclusion, like, how long do I want to sit with a lot of these troubles? So for me, it's like, see, learning is not enough. We have to act on what we learn. And for me, it's um, building a better bond and 
communicating more. Now it's it's a struggle. It's a door that you have to open and constantly keep from shutting because it's so heavy. So um, stick with it if you're attempting to going into or are in therapy. Um, yeah. This is what's next. We'll be back with more from author Dorian Withrow Jr. after this short break. Explore the intersection of music and mental health with Mindful Music, hosted by mental health advocate and educator Carl Shalomar. Listen to guests share how they use music to express their inner nature and manage their emotional well-being. Listen to Mindful Music on Saturdays at 4 p.m. and Sundays at 8 p.m. on WBFO. Birds, whether common or rare, delight me. That's what our new Now We're Birding and Enjoying Nature Club is all about. Oh yes, and the best is being with people who are also interested in wildflowers, animals, and of course, birds. Come along with us, won't you, Peter Hall and me, Stratton Rawson, as we lead monthly excursions to Tift or Rheinstein Woods Nature Preserves. To sign up, go to wned.org front slash birding. This is the WBFO History Bite, bringing you a peek into significant historical events for the week of October 30th through November 5th. I'm your host, Josh Deckert. On October 31st, 1968, Buffalo's own WKBW broadcast a remake of the War of the Worlds radio drama for Halloween. On November 1st, 1941, the Bell Aircraft Corporation, located in Buffalo, began development on new aviation technology, the helicopter. On November 3rd, 1997, the Buffalo Niagara International Airport opened. The airport now manages over 100 flights daily. And on November 5th, 1993, Nirvana performed at the University of Buffalo. The band played at the Alumni Arena. You've been listening to the WBFO History Bite. Discover more stories about Western New York's past on the Buffalo History Museum's website. You can learn more at buffalohistory.org. For WBFO, I'm Josh Deckert. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And you're listening to What's Next. I'm host Thomas O'Neill White, and I'm sitting here with author, poet, storyteller, martial artist, activist, and advocate, advocate Dorian Withrow Jr. One, one more question for you um, just regarding building bonds. Do you, um, you feel building a better bond with your father helps you with your other relationships? Yeah, I think building your bond with uh, anyone you've had trouble with in the past, um, maybe not so positive experiences, but you have had positive experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're taxed with, like, building a bond with somebody you did have trouble with, it bleeds into other relationships in the aspect of, like, you know, um, overcoming troubles, getting through things, and eventually you know, having a better relationship at the end of it. And I think that should be the goal for people that have trouble with others, you know, not necessarily giving up, but how can we amend, change things? Mm-hmm. Um, not burn bridges. Yeah, because yeah. you don't know which bridge you'll need to cross at whatever point. Right. And what's ideal for yourself and your progress, growth, and what, so on and so forth. So don't look for every fault that someone makes as well right let's not focus on the fault but 
that strive to appreciate a new outlook and um, improvement. And, and that is very hard. Mm -hmm. It know? is. It's not easy. So whatever you have to do to make that happen, um, see somebody to mediate a conversation, um, read a self-help book. Um, when it comes, like, you know, see a counselor, things mm -hmm. like that. I think that'll help with um, building a better bond with somebody you're having trouble with. Getting back to mental health, do you think there is a, a, a problem with mental health or, or a lack there of seeking mental help for African-American men? Yeah, I think um, yeah, we come back to the stigma mm -hmm. conversation, a very common conversation. But I think um, with beating stigma, we have to get rid of the fear. We have to acknowledge that we have a problem. That's number one. And for people that may see a problem in somebody else, want to help them, don't bring up mental health conversations when there is an issue happening, when there's an argument, there's fighting, when there's criticism. That's not the time to bring up, to tell somebody, oh, you need counseling. It's better to do so in a more positive manner, um, a more appropriate space for that, because then associations begin between, you know, I don't want to go because, I, all right, I got a problem now. It was a negative environment when you brought that up, mm -hmm. you know. So um, I think those things are key, like really acknowledging don't fight and bring it up, but also have em empathy for the person too. Put yourself in their shoes, understand their troubles, but also encourage, but do not be condescending or demeaning, insulting, and things like that. Do you think, like, our appearance as, like, hyper-masculine beings has uh, enhances that stigma that black men cannot open up? Because we are portrayed this way, not necessarily that we are, but there's this portrayal that we are, and we kind of have to live up to that. Yeah, I think that these um, cultural solidified um, ideals that we have sometimes hinder our growth for our own progress, um, for building relationships, for mm -hmm. crying, for... Um, and it's not to say that those things make you soft. It's not to say that those things make you weak. Right. But it is to say that there are some components of ourselves that we need to touch on a bit more so that we can become better for our children, for the younger ones coming up, for our relationships, to avoid the violence and the fighting and the needless things that happen across the board leading to people to prison and so on and so forth. And um, it's a tough stigma to change, but interviews like this, um, advocating for it, don't pose mental health in a negative manner to somebody um, and treat it as if you're going to the gym, treat it as if mm -hmm. you're going to a doctor's checkup, you know, take care of yourself. It's your mind is probably the first most important thing, second to your body. Your body will go at some point, but then you have your mind and, and that goes. Can't really say, but, you know, we we don't have much. Right. Right. I read an article about you um, that was published over the summer. You had a message for high school kids. And, and and the quote was it was it was short and it was simple. Don't just exist. What do you mean by that? To me, that means um, don't. Be this person to not achieve your goals. Don't be this person to not uh, strive for becoming a better person, doing the best that you can do. Don't be this person to just kind of fall to the wayside of the world and not um, see what all you can do, you know. Become something great. Become something better than what your parents were, grandparents, um, your friends and influences. We've got about 
five minutes left in the program. Um, one of the last things I wanted to ask you is, is what's next for you? Uh, what's next for me? Um, I'm working on this book. I don't have a title for it yet. I can't give a definitive date. I don't, uh -huh. I don't have that for you, but I anticipate late winter. Um, for me, continuing Taekwondo, I'm in graduate school for mental health counseling. I mean, I'm really enjoying it. I have a, I've been taking one class of uh, theories and counseling, and I'm really enjoying that because I get to work out the particular theories that these counselors have brought to the space, um, different approaches to helping somebody with a variety of concerns or disorders. Mm -hmm. um, well, where do you see yourself in five years, um, continuing on that path? Yeah, I think um, graduating. I want to have much more income produce yeah. more books and uh <laughs> i want to be able to help a lot of people and for me i think um improving upon what i'm already doing but also getting into new spaces for uh, i would say like marketing myself or um engaging brand deals i'd like to do that um business opportunities i'm very open mm -hmm. so uh yeah, people can see my books at dswjr.com, dswjr.com. You're able to see my services, my books, reach out to me. Um, send me an email on the homepage, and I can add you onto the emailing list. Just say emailing list or whatever, and I'll uh, get you on an update what I'm doing. Is there anything you're reading or seeing currently that is influencing you? Uh, reading, what are you dig uh, what are you digging on? Uh, I would say reading some more schoolwork these days. That's <laughs> I enjoy the readings. It's different yeah. when you have to versus when you want to. Mm, um Right. But uh watching I don't know, staying up to stuff on all the social media jazz in that respect, but um influencing me, I think just learning more about finance. Learning more about, you know, the self improvement stuff, whatever it comes up, and see a video, or whatever. Um, not much TV these days, but a lot of the engaging the schoolwork. Yeah, yeah. We got about three minutes left. Um, last question, very broad. I'd like to ask everyone this: um, What does what does Western New York need? What does Buffalo need? Um, I I think I might have asked you that mm -hmm. a year ago. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? Have they changed over a year? Like I said before, mental health counseling, counselors, teaching in schools, um, therapeutic processes and coping mechanisms, um, teaching what healthy relationships are, friendships, and um, dealing with the stresses that come with school and outside of school. I think that's what Western New York needs. Um, another thing I would say uh, let's boost the fatherhood initiative too. Let's mm -hmm. tackle some of the things that really place people in jail. Let's um bring the moral education. Let's bring the you know positive influences to light for these young ones coming up, so that they can see a different way of approaching their behaviors, um, education, or business and entrepreneurship, whatever they would aspire to do um yeah that's that's all i got yeah as they say it it, it takes a village you know to yeah. raise the child this has been what's next i want to thank my guest author dorian withrow jr for being with us today and you're listening to wbfo and wbfo hd1 buffalo WOLN Olean and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station. Thanks for being with us today.